Yeah, have we met before? Are you I don't a... think... No, you because I was just wondering if you were some like super fan or something back in the day. Because <laughs> you know what, we we did a show. Maybe this should be we talk about that. But I was I, I was working with a band quite a while ago, maybe two thousand and seven. There was a guy called Rory, who started to drum, and he told me that Pete did a show for Rock Against Racism in Trafalgar Square one time, and we after it we jumped in a taxi and there was some young kid tracing chasing us up Trafalgar Square, like chasing the taxi. And then Rory told me that was him. So, um, <laughs> so do you know what I mean? Like, you know, people get older and, you know, cause I'm a very old guy now. And, um, you know, and then everyone, you know, everybody's got their memories. So, uh, but yeah. No, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you have a lot of stories like that to be fair. But yeah, well, that was quite nice though. Cause I remembered it very clearly when he said, cause there was one kid who wouldn't stop chasing the taxi, was very persistent. <laughs> yeah, it was Rory, so I hope he's doing good. I haven't seen him in a while, but um, yeah, sorry. I've got, I'll, I'll let me turn this further over so I don't see it. I don't know, yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Mm. Um, yeah, cheers for doing this, mate. Like, uh, yeah, like been speaking to people that are in and around kind of that scene and baby shambles and stuff. And I know you have an interesting story by the looks of it in terms of like setting up record labels and, and all that. Like, how what was the lead up into everything kind of thing? Of of getting into the music, thing. I think so. Yeah, like what what was like? That's a good um, your uh, route into it. Yeah. Well, I was just you know I oh, I guess it's I guess it's um I don't know where do you start with that um just you know I get I guess that's I mean where you know because I can think of various routes in but I guess it would be my friend Robert and then he would be coming to um he sort of knew people from what was the Camberwell scene that was sort of, I guess that's where Pulp came out of because Jarvis was down there. And then, and then that became sort of the Shoreditch scene in the, in the mid nineties. And, um, and so I, I, via Robert, I got to know, you know, hanging around in Shoreditch in, in, in sort of the, yeah, mid to late, yeah, to early, late nineties, mid to late nineties or whatever. And, um, got to know a load of people and then there was lots of creative people and um I thought they made interest in music I guess I guess we have to rewind slightly because my introduction I guess what the true introduction was when I was at university studying furniture design there was a an album that uh, Mr Bongos had discovered in India it was by it was a uh, it was um Ananda Shankar and Friends and it was that he'd found eight copies of it and no one had, and, and there was been a tape going about with two songs on it, Dancing Drums and Streets of Calcutta. And um, these were amazing sort of Indian, you know, sitar, sitar tabla sort of, I guess, sort of psych, psych sort of beat music, I guess. Yeah. And because Indian albums of the time that were made in the late 60s and early 70s had like a Western crossover track on them uh you know there's Rasta Carpata. there was a few albums at the time that would have this and anyway there'd been this tape going about uh and it had these two songs on it and then Mr Bongos came back the guy had been over there and he'd found eight copies and I think they were like 700 pounds each was a, which was a lot of money in in the mid 90s it's a lot of money now for a record but it was hell of a lot of money then and I took my student grant check with a I won't name the guy but with a, a friend of mine and um, I bought, I used my student loan and I bought one of these albums and we we bootlegged the, a, a 12 inch, a white label. And we used to get this place. It doesn't matter who pressed them, I suppose. But um, and then it paid my way through college, sell it, selling this white label of uh of, of these two tracks. And, it, you know, because no one could get it on anything. I think it came out on um maybe Blue Note did a reissue of it after that, or someone did a reissue. And it's, it's they're quite rich and the album's been reissued now. I don't think it's worth as much money. But um, so I'd learned the process of, um, of, um, of making a vinyl record. So when I started hanging about and there was all these creative people, I, I, and I, you know, I've, I was a record collector when I was a kid. You know, I've still got records I had when I was 12 and all that. And, um, and, um, yeah, and then, you know, and it just seemed natural progression 
to then sort of combine the two things, interest in records, this this knowledge of how to get records made and meeting people and to start a little record label, which I did, High Society Records, and we put out, um, you know, and um, that's how I met Peter and Carl initially because uh, my friend Justin uh, hooked us up. Uh, you know, he said, oh, these guys are great. And I do have, st I do still have some recordings of these very strange versions of s some of the songs from the first Libertines album that are done with a drum machine. And there's, there's sort of these weird electronic versions. I haven't listened to it in a long time, but I still had it somewhere, um, a CD with them on. And um, I'm sure I kept it, but they're very bizarre versions of, you know, maybe half of the first Libertines album that they had embryonic uh, versions of. So um, I guess, yeah, that was my route in. to, And then going, just being on the scene all the time and, you know, living you know, buying records, going to see bands uh, and, and having a lot of creative people around. I guess that was the route into doing that sort of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. And like how, I don't know, how excited were you by what was going on? Did it feel, did it feel a bit different to what had gone on before? Or was it like a point where you thought something's happening kind of thing? Well, I, I guess... I guess, you know, it, it was the time, it was a transitional time, as I understand it, because, you know, it'd been a, we'd had a long period of dance music in the UK. Uh, you know, I didn't really get into the whole Nirvana thing and all that. I was raving at the time, and it was like a big DJ-led sort of music thing. And then, obviously, you know, the Strokes came out, uh, you know, and I guess there's the White Stripes, and, you know, there's this little group of... Um, uh american bands and that's what libertines came out of i guess that sort of transitional time but i was doing sort of just weird sort of stuff. i mean if if you know uh the stuff we we were doing on on high society records was kind of quite odd i suppose it was it was traditional sort of indie music you know there was guitar you know four piece sort of band stuff as well but a lot of synthesizer and sort of just odd cover versions and just like, weird, yeah, weird stuff. I was really, I was, I it was a great time for me. I mean, I, I don't know musically that it was very new, but it was all very new to me. Um, and it was exciting. And, you know, in retrospect, you know, if I'm honest, it was feeding, because I've, I've always been very socially quite awkward. And to be a facilitator, uh, sort of just, um, you know, you know, it's an ego thing, like to be at a party and being involved and having to be a player rather than just a consumer was something that felt good. So I was having a good time and, you know, um, and actually contributing. I suppose that's a positive way of putting at it, sort of sort of slightly more selfless view. But I don't, you know, um, that's not necessarily. Yeah, it was it was good. And it was good. I mean, because it's funny, I, I, you know, I used to. I'm just really into the Sex Pistols and I've still got all my Sex Pistols singles to this day. I've, I've got pretty much, you know, I wouldn't say every release, but I've got all the UK Sex Pistols singles and they were mastered at a mastering house in town called Porky's. It was Porky's Master Studio and they would, on when you on the run out groove, um, if you ever, I'm sure people know, have got vinyl records, there's, there's some identifiers for the, for the, you know, for the, for the for the for the pressing but often there's also a little message in there and it would always say another porky's prime cut on um when i was a kid you know i was a kid in the countryside and i would you know i'd always go to the mill and sometimes you'd have a little message from the band or something you know for you know and um they it was like it was like a it was like a you know a ten commandment it was like an etched stone you know like uh obelisk of something that I didn't know anything about so to actually being involved in all that was really exciting for me do you know what I mean and I was and I was enjoying the process and uh, 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 and doing this stuff it, yeah it was good it was good I felt I felt, I felt good and it was it gave a lot of meaning you know at that time I was, it was yeah in fact I really got my teeth so it was a great time for me I mean I was so broke I'd put every penny into releasing my records I remember I used to just eat apples and cheese on bread <laughs> and then, no, seriously, I but I love it. You know, it was a great time, and I've got to say, you know, that was there was a lot more simple joy in that than you know that ultimately 
that I got out of working with Peter later. Do you know what I mean? That turned into that made you know on that level things were a lot more complicated, and you know various other reasons it got more complicated. But um, uh, there was a lot of joy in just finding an artist or a piece of music that I liked, um, somehow contacting them by one way or another, talking to them, you know, somehow you know getting some kind of like connection going and then take recording and then mastering and releasing the record and promoting it that's just you know that really grassroots simple sort of indie indie music uh publishing i guess in in a you know production publishing i mean you know mechanical recording i don't know what the you know <laughs> various terms you could put it but yeah it was, it was yeah it was for me so yeah is there anything new i don't know yeah, I mean, for me, I I've always <clears throat> I've always loved um, to hear some. You know, for, I don't really hear the lyrics for the first couple of times when I hear a tune. I look for something sonically like novel to me. So that's that's what catches my ear first. And you know, and it probably wasn't really a lyrics guy at all. Well, I won't say at all, but I, working with Peter because he was a lyricist you know that was a you know a good part of what he did that that sort of did uh turn me on more to lyrics and you know to this day i'm discovering sort of records that i've had in my collection for years and then really getting into the lyrics of them so you know actually connecting better with it so um yeah i, I would just be if i found something sonically i found unusual then i'd want to put it on a record and, and it, you know and, and you're just meeting good people and like connecting it's interesting that idea that if you're if you're into the same stuff and you you know you like the same music you, you kind of like the same imagery like the same films then you kind of generally i've i don't know if it's strictly true but kind of get on as well do you know what i mean no, not just on the level of like collecting things but just as people I, you know i don't know no yeah we've had people that said that about you know finding bandmates it's like more finding people that are like-minded that than like what they can do with a with an instrument kind of thing yeah that's how they get somewhere mm. i guess it's like you know buying records where you can't listen to them and you, you know just because i i've i've taken the gamble a few times and uh, on quite a number of occasions if you like the artwork and then i don't you know and uh, you know sort of i don't know what it's like these days but really, you know the artist would obviously select you know the musical artists would select the artist to do the cover or have some kind of input on it and so if you if you that's how you wanted your record cover then i'm probably going to like because i really love your choice of artwork then i'm going to really like your choice of music i've definitely had some misses over the years using that <laughs> but i feel like it's slightly more reliable than they used my girlfriend used to work in reckless records and there was a guy in there he was a long-term customer and he kept coming back and he would lick records. That would be, seems to be his process of selecting them. He would ask, he'd take the cover up, he'd ask for the record, he would lick it. And on that basis, whatever feedback he was getting, that would be his decision-making process. Now, <laughs> wow. I never asked him if he liked what he bought, but I kept coming back and, you know, carrying out the same, uh, like, method to in the <laughs> shop so i presume it was working for him so you know i use cover up some people lick some people just <laughs> listen how about that that's an idea <laughs> yeah it's a new one on me um <laughs> well, yeah, i haven't seen him in a while he probably shops online now so i don't know how he, how he... <laughs> it's harder to get it's harder. he's missing the record shops <laughs> um Yes, how would, what was the main way of finding new bands? And would just be a lot of gigs and stuff? Or would you get sent a lot of tapes or anything? Just word of mouth, really. Just like scene it was I, 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 When I did my little label, it was all sort of scene stuff, you know. Um, and yeah, and just people I knew, really. Yeah, and it was just a lot of fun, you know. And then, and then it just spreads, spreads out from that. There was... Yeah, I guess, and you know, no one made any money really, but you know, Whitey did okay. The Towers of London had their moment. I mean, you know, jo Johnny Burrell, God love him, came out of that scene. Peter and Carl did great. Um, 
you know, you know, even what's the name? You know, there was a few people, like, you know, Richard Fearless was out there, you know, Andy Weatherall was about. There's lots of people in depth in Vegas. I was um God, I can't remember now. Like, yeah, lots of people about. So, you know, on that scene. So um yeah, and just interesting. Just you know, there's so many great single songs out there, you know, and it doesn't have to be if you like it, put it out. That was sort of my philosophy. And I, you know, I sort of collect stuff for my house. And um, if I want it on my, that's, you know, if I, that's how I work. If I want to hang it on my wall and I want to look at it every day, then it's good. Do you know what I mean? You can't, if you enjoy it, you can't be wrong, right? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> yeah. on one level, I mean, if you spend a lot of money, maybe it's an error, but, you know, in promotion or whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It's interesting you mentioned that because in, in Pete Doherty's recent book, he said that's one of the things that kind of excited him about working with you was the idea. I think you had an idea that you're going to release a single, one single a month or something. Right. That's interesting because I haven't read Peter's book. I ah, okay. it was out. Um, yeah, we, um, it's a long time ago now, you know. That kind of rings a bell. That kind mm. of rings a bell. Uh, but, um, yeah, I remember. I remember us recording the Baby Shambles single, and I, you know, I remember getting the go ahead with Rough Trade to do that. Uh, and I remember putting it on the label. Yeah, I remember doing that. Yeah, we were. Yeah, we. I can't remember the plans. Do you know what I mean? It was. An, mm. It was. A good, it was a good time. You know, because as I said, you know, I'd sort of demoed them, and obviously, and I and his manageress at the time, I think her name was Banny. Yeah. Um, uh, she signed them to a rough trade, which obviously was the right thing to do. And, you know, whatever happened, you know, went down with Pete and Carl is what it is. And then, um, yeah, and then we start, you know, we started working together. And it was kind of designed as his sort of, I think the idea was it was sort of a, a play away distraction to give him some kind of outlet that hopefully would release the pressure within the band I, I you know that was never actually like a said thing but um I definitely think that's what it was it would didn't make any sense otherwise you know I just guess there was so much uh tension yeah you know you make me think of stuff I haven't thought about for a while you know <laughs> do I get controversial or do I just keep it keep it keep it as it you know but um um yeah, and I guess that's what we, you know, we did, and we were doing a lot of touring. He'd break. There, there was a lot of stuff went down in that period. You know what I mean? And and uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of, a lot of strange, yeah, interesting stuff. I did because I've never read. I don't know. You know, I, I think Adam might have brought out of a book. Is that right? Adam Firecheck might have done something. Yeah, I'm um, not sure about that. No, I don't know. I know at one point he was planning, it and I don't know how those right things. So I don't know what people know about sort of libertines baby shambles and peter that or don't so i don't okay, know, right. i don't know if everything i'm saying is old i might say is old news but you know there's lots of interesting stories um yeah you know what i mean i don't know what the you know the um What's the word? The etiquette is. Do you know what I mean? Like, do you just say, like, do we really open and, like, drop? Because it's, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Let's we'll just suffice on. to say, you know, it was interesting working with Rough Trade at the time. That's, you know, that's a gentle way of putting it. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, in the book, he says that you had a bit of a, an ongoing battle with him, kind of thing. Yeah. I didn't get on great with Jeff, must be said. Mr. Travis didn't get on great with him. Uh, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't find him particularly honest guy. I've got to say. Uh, yeah, I didn't get on great with Jeff, but you know, um, Jeanette was amazing. James Endicott's cool. I've forgotten the old Scottish guy's name, but yeah, on the whole, I got. On, I, 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 you know, I had a lot of respect for all of them, and you know, you can't not respect Jeff Travis because he is. I mean, that's the that's the birth of UK indie, right? Mm -hmm. Rough trade. I've still got. Rough trade number one to this day in Paris Mac with what Metal Urbane, I think, is rough trade number one, uh, seven inch RTO01, I think. So, you know, and I've got a number of their very early singles. So, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, great, great labels. So, uh, 
you know, can't get on with everyone, right? <laughs> <laughs> I am a little bit gutted that I didn't get my gold disc for um uh um that first David Shambles album, but hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Might come one day, you never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Who knows? Yeah, I can make one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what's that like? I mean, it, he describes you as, uh, sorry, in the book he describes you as like anti-music industry and he liked your renegade tactics. But what was it like going up against someone like Rough Trade? Did you have to like really back yourself? Well, it's interesting. That, that's funny. You say, well, no, because I was about the artist. You know, the music interest is interesting. There's an amazing book um, and it gave me some great insight into the, the modern music industry. I've forgotten the author's name, but it's it's... It's the pop music in 21st century. Oh, I've got I've forgotten the night. It's, it's an American book and it's 20th century music industry. I, I, so I've still got it at home, but it, ex, it explains the birth of um, recorded music uh, and then sort of the business of music as it, as it, as the 20th century unfolded and, you know, into the 1960s. I think it was written in the eighties, the book. And, um, you know, the truth is, if you're a manager who signs an act to a major label, you do not represent your artist. That's as simple as that. You're playing a game. And, you know, most bands don't, you know, if you want a career as a music manager, I don't know, maybe you want to be in the game 20 years, 25 years. Very few bands will last 20, 25 years. So you might have a hot property but if it lasts five years and you're very loyal to your band and you piss off all the industry, then you they're gonna you know that's not working. So you have, it's it's you feed artists into the system. It all goes happens as it happens, and then uh, then you have to feed the next artist in. So the reality is, you know I you know, uh, and I put all my eggs in a basket, and. Um, and my actions led to me probably losing the loyalty of that basket, which kind of left me quite high and dry. But that, that was my action. So, you know, I didn't, you know, I was given a great opportunity and it went well for a while. And then it went a bit, a bit tom. But I would definitely say, yeah, Renegade, I was very, very, you know, very loyal. To, yeah, I fought for my artists against and there was a lot of conflict around that and i don't know you know i don't because i've not read pete's thing i don't i don't know if he realizes you know how i was i definitely was not playing both sides in that <laughs> which is like i don't know it would in retrospect would i have played it differently i don't know who knows but um yeah no i was very loyal to peter and i was a child i was very loyal to peter at the time no doubt about that and um and uh yeah it's, you know he was a very special personality. Uh, you know, I haven't hung out with him for a long time, so I don't know who the guy is now. So, uh, but yeah, he was very, a very charismatic young man, no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. How old were you at, at that time in the early two thousands? I'm ten years older than Peter. I was born in nineteen sixty nine. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, I guess we were working two thousand and four, two thousand three, two thousand four. So I was thirty five then. So I wasn't young. Yeah, yeah. So kind of you knew, you knew what you liked at that point, kind of thing. If that makes sense. Um, you know, I, I suppose it's you know, what do we say on this? You know, it's more, you know, I, 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 I was adopted as a kid, right? And I've never really felt attached to anything. And then I joined the army, and then that's a very tight knit group. Uh, you know, you you have to bond together, and you're you're part of a team. And it's sort of I don't really know, you know, the mechanics of what engineered that, but I like the idea. You know, a little band of pirates. Do you know what I mean? And uh, as, and that's our clique, and you're in or you're out. And I'm, you know, and I, you know, I fought one way or another for friends all my life. So. If I'm loyal to you, I'm in with you. You know what I mean. And then it's us against them, and that's not necessarily a great way to 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 run in life. It's probably not. It's not. Um, I don't know. It's not diplomatic. <laughs> so um, I was going to say mature or professional, but I chose to say diplomatic. I don't know. 
might be neither none of those three or or the other two might be irrelevant but um yeah it wasn't a diplomatic way to operate but um it, it felt um sincere yeah no there's you know there's yeah, again, it's like, you know, I could use these situations to illustrate, but it's, you know, it's all in the past. Is it relevant? But yeah, I, do, I would agree with that. You know, I, you know, I was I had I did an interview for The New York Times once and this was going to go on my gravestone for a period of time. But maybe hopefully by the time I die, it'll be a little bit in the future. I'll have a new epitaph. But the, the, the late it was there was quoted that the James Malord is the last true believer in popular music today. And I loved it. And um, I don't know if that was a blessing or a curse to get that because it reinforced my worldview uh, and my worldview. That might be part of my worldview, but it reinforced other parts of my worldview that weren't probably so beneficial. But um, but I did. I like the quote. I was very pleased to have received that quote. So, yeah, if that, if that illustrates that Peter wasn't the only person to see it like that. That's three of us, Peter, me, and whoever wrote that. <laughs> Maybe there's others, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe others. <laughs> um, you mentioned Barney, just because I'm going to keep referencing the book, sorry. I know you've not read it, but... <laughs> That's cool, well, yeah, because at least it's all new. And it will be like, I can't have um, planned any answers, so yeah. <laughs> uh, but you said you had a, a battle with Barney for the soul of the Libertines. Does that make sense to you? Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's perspectives, isn't there? I mean, did I... It's interesting how they might have seen that. I don't... Yeah, I don't... No, I don't know. If I think... I think... I think she did the right thing. So if this is... No, because I think she'd been... Yeah, because, no, by the time... Yeah, when she signed them to Rough Trade, I think that was the right thing to do. And I think she created, you know, whatever that, you know, the mechanism was to... Because they hadn't really found a sound. You know, they had Pete and Carl acoustic guitars and um, a number of the songs that would later go on to be the first album. But they didn't have a sound. And I thought, you know, I thought they did a great job. Uh, that first album sounds great. You know what I mean? I don't actually have my copy anymore. I don't know what happened to it. Um, so that's a shame. I'll have to get it again. But um, but so I would. I don't know about that. And then by the time I... By the time I got involved with Peter a couple of years later, two or three years later, um, Alan McGee was um, do, working with them. So, but that's only perspectives. I wasn't, I don't know how Banny saw it. And um, and I don't really remember, you know, I don't, I don't you know, it's a, it's a long time ago now. <laughs> yeah, I, fair enough. You fair know, enough. If, if, you know, um, yeah, no, that's just I probably don't have the clearest memory of, of of everyone. You know, I don't know. But yeah, no, if Pete says that interesting, I'd like to talk to him too. Wait, you know, I'd ask him if I, you know, hopefully one day we'll we can have a a cup of tea together and uh and you know have a chat about it. Yeah, yeah. And where then where does um White Sport come into it? Is that Pat's first band and Adams? That's right. I mean, I feel a little bit, you know, that's an interesting one. You know, I've what to say about the white sport. The white sport was uh, Andrew, a guy called Andrew Avery, who's a very you know close friend, a very dear friend of mine to this day. And um, um, yeah, it was it was Andrew. I think it was just the three of them. I think it might have been Andrew, Pat, and Adam because Andrew sung, played guitar. Pat Pat did the bass, I think, for them. And then Adam did drums. Maybe, maybe Pat did guitar and George might. It's a long time. George might, because George definitely played bass a bit. Um, but yeah, so, and so that's right. Because what, what happened originally was, yeah, Patrick, I can't remember exactly how it split, but Patrick would come and play with Peter and then the white sport was support. And I think Pat used to do both shows. I think he used to play in both bands. And I, you know, because Pete was originally, he had, um, I think it was Scarborough Steve was in Baby Shambles. And then there was a Welsh guy. There was, an, I mean, 
you know, I don't want to diss anybody, but it, let's just say it wasn't the most, um, uh, they didn't have, what would, how would you put it? <laughs> it's living up to the name at that point, is it? Yeah, it wasn't the greatest like engine uh, of a band. And, you know, Pat, you know, Pat, I think Pat is an amazing guitarist. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and uh, you know, in a parallel universe, he, he, you know, he could be one of the greats, you know, if things have been different. But, um, and then, so, uh, you know, I sort of linked up with Peter and we sort of swapped people out. Uh, Pat came in. You know, I don't know if you know Seb Ra Roachford, you know, incredible drummer, uh, session drummer. He came and played, I got Seb in and he came and played on the Baby Shambles single that we recorded. Um, I think it might have just been, I think that would have been Pat, Pete and Seb would have been the players on that. I don't, I'll have to look at it and see who gets credited. But, um, and so he had, a, he had, you know, they're a great musician, Seb, isn't it? You know, Pat plays with Seb today and Seb's a hugely respected sort of session jazz guy. Do you know what I mean? And, and a beautiful energy as well. I mean, it's got it. He'd come in the room full of us lunatics and he'd just bring it to a beautiful calmness. I mean, the guy just exudes just a nice level. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you know Pat and obviously Peter and I'm quite, we're quite hectic. And, and Seb could really, I'd just come down to Seb's level or up to Seb's level, depending on how you want to look at it. But, um, and uh, yeah, I can't remember what you were asking, but yeah, that was, that was, and sort of assembled that around people. I don't think Seb wanted to be part of it. And then Gemma was, I've forgotten her dad's name, but he used to run a rehearsal studio uh, in Old Street somewhere. And so somehow Gemma and Pat used to work at the rehearsal studio and he got, she played drums. So Gemma came down and got involved and, you know. And, you know, it took a while. It did, you know, it wasn't the band that the Libertines were for sure. You know, like Gary and John, you know, they're doing. Uh, and it took a little while. I do remember when we used to we used to tour a lot in the Green Van, and I think I think it might have been the first proper tour we did. That I remember, and it was it was in I think it was the Fez Club. I think it's in Leeds. Because we'd go and everybody would be cheering, like shouting. When people come on, they'd be shouting "Libertines, Libertines," and I remember it that day. Um, they started cheering for Baby Shambles, and it just—it was a great moment, you know, for this sort of allegiance. And I—that was the day the band came together and started playing. And we'd gone on this tour, and you know, you know it was quite interesting because we'd gone away as like en laughing stocks of the enemy. And, um, you know, you can't, you know, it's never going to work, load of fucking idiots. It's not necessarily wrong, but um, we did like a 30-odd date tour and were totally disconnected from any sort of media, didn't pay any attention, just went, did show to show to show, came back and come and did a couple of nights at the Scala and um, they were like the biggest like, UK band. It was absolutely, it was a great feeling, I've got to say. It was great and uh, like, and it wasn't just, other people's opinions that night in the Fez Club, it, it, like it knew it had come together, and they, you know, I'm not saying it's like, you know, it's not Soft Machine or you know, what I mean, or King Crimson or like any of these sort of really tight bands or maybe even Oasis in that sense, but like they came together as a unit and people like started accepting them, and um, and uh, yeah, it was it was good, yeah, and, and like so the other bands, you know, and I felt like I was doing a good job at the time. You know what I mean? It felt like I was doing a good job. Whether I was or not, I don't know, but it certainly felt like it. <laughs> like I said, like, Pete kind of mentioned he played, you know, a pivotal role of, like, getting him out of... It sounds like the situation with the Libertines, he wanted something else. He, he didn't like the direction it was going in. But there's, like, a really specific detail about you sending him... He said he calls it a beautiful, poetic text to, like, that made him want to make that leap and really go for baby shambles. I'm not sure if you remember that, but no. But as I said, you know, we were very close back then. I don't remember. I remember. Don't remember the text, but I do. There's various times I remember that were really, you know, very emotional. And I felt very close to Peter, you know, and uh, 
you know, I distinctly remember one time, you know, he said I'd saved his life, you know, by just sort of, you know, helping him, re you know, by re-putting together something, you know, because he was washed up. He was, uh, you know, uh, using a lot of drugs, you know, ultimately, as we all were. So, you know, junkie, I'm a junkie, Pete was a junkie. I don't know what he's doing these days. Um, I was on my way to becoming a junkie. I don't know if I was at the time. And yeah, he was like, he'd messed everything up and a great, you know, on the cusp of a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, it, as they were just sort of, you know, I mean, obviously the first album was good, but it was growing. And um, yeah, I remember it was in his place over in, um, I guess, behind Whitechapel, behind the Sainsbury's there, isn't it? Yeah, some silly little, fl like little flat in an estate there that Alan had paid for. And um, yeah, in there, and you know, he said, thanks for saving my life. Yeah, we were close, man. It was some, it was good. So yeah, I can't remember the text, but it was very, very, very special times, do you know what I mean? Very, very special times, you know, and, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Do you know what the text says? Does he say <laughs> that in his book? Um, no, I think, I don't think he goes into that detail, but I think it's just more around you, <laughs> We just solely focus on the music, as you've mentioned, whereas everyone else, well, a lot of people on Libertines are concerned about, you know, his habits, as, you, as you've mentioned, but you were more, you saw it as like a bigger picture than that. Like you just wanted to get the music out there, I think. Yeah, because, you know, I was, I, I suppose, you know, I guess my naivety was an asset at that point because I didn't really understand, you know, the pressures The, the you know the the the, the financial I suppose, I suppose pressures of it and for me it was just I believed in Peter a lot you know he could write for me at the time and I, he could write a top ten song in ten minutes any time of the day or night if he said you know very he was on fire back then and I I remember thinking at one time that if he just sat me down and said James I want to be prime minister I would have started working on it and I'm not <laughs> exaggerating I'm not exaggerating this is a thought from Back then, I thought to myself, you do, I believed in the guy that much. And we felt so powerful. And, uh, you know, and uh, it felt, you know, it probably sounds like quite lunacy. But, um, yeah, so I was a great believer in the guy. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. And I was just, I was I was back in my, like, all the eggs in the basket. Yeah, no, I was back in Peter Doherty. And, yeah, I guess maybe I, yeah. I get it. I was packing packing Peter Doherty. So um uh yeah, it was about what he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was yeah, yeah. And you mentioned the touring and uh you know you said the story earlier about the uh the fan chase and the taxi. <laughs> like mm. how I don't know, like was it just like kind of what was happening at the time? You kind of just got on with it, or was it a bit like, wow, this is a bit mental? <laughs> what the touring? Yeah, and just all like the uh, tension that was that was on Pete at that time. Well, because he got a lot bigger than then. You know, I guess Pete got to his, you know, got bigger when he was dating Kate. I, I wasn't necessarily following it, but I presume that was as big as he got in a tabloid sense, but, um, or, or, you know, mass appeal. But um, back in the early touring, we would, I worked for a company called, by then I was doing PPQ Records, but they were a clothing company, PPQ, and they had a green Mercedes van and then i think every weekend we would borrow it uh, i presume it was the weekend because they would use it during the week to pick up fabric deliver or whatever they do and because uh, yeah we were in their basement and um and then we borrow this van at the weekend and we'd fill it up with people you know the band and then a couple of people want to come and then we would drive to some place up north i can't remember you do gigs and it was it was very exciting do you know what i mean and you know, I, I when we met Matt Bates, somehow he got in touch and wanted us to come up and do a gig. He he was a I don't know if you know who Matt Bates is that he was a he was their tour manager and he went on to be, you know, a very successful. I haven't spoken to Vegas, but he was very successful uh, in the two thousand tens. I'm sure he's done very well for himself. He's a great businessman. Um, um, and then he wanted us to do a show up in Stoke. He had a little club called The Underground, I think it was, up in Stoke. This is early on because Pete had the bouncers then that Rough Trade had provided because 
they'd been recording him and the Ribertines had been recording. And I think Pete and Carl kept on getting physical altercations. And we had this big sort of like guy, like a proper bouncer who would travel everywhere. I think, yeah, this was prior to that. So yeah. And this guy, and he was in Stoke for this. So he, it was early on and, um, and a Carl turned up. It was quite funny. So there are copies of, I remember, I wish I had one. There was, we were giving out CDs of of the Baby Shambles single, and there's copies of that that both Pete and Carl have signed going about that people have got, which is a quite cool thing to have. But, yeah, the Stoke Club got wrecked that night. I can't remember why it kicked. It just used to be right, because I remember, in, you know, in the early Libertines days, like, you'd go, they'd go and play that place down in um, sort of Whitechapel. I've forgotten what that place was called, but the energy in there was absolutely amazing, you know, considering this at the time was quite an under, because it was the early days of chat rooms, I think. And they had, so I, as far in my experience, they were like the first people to have this sort of dynamic sort of chat following and have very passionate fans. And you'd go to their gigs and there'd be a, a really great energy in there. Do you know what I mean? And they'd come on, it was highly charged stuff. It was great. And um, I've, there's not many gigs I've been to that, with that energy to this day, do you know what I mean? Um, you know, I've been to some great gigs by big bands, uh, but you know, I don't know really. I don't think like the like the anticipation of the of a band work walking on stage, other than Michael Jackson in 1985, <laughs> which was the greatest moment in my no, in 1988 was the greatest moment in my life at the time. But I don't think, yeah, the anticipation of someone coming to perform on stage, I don't think I've seen it. And obviously, Michael Jackson's, you know, he's that's different different kettle of fish but um yeah so you know then you know right we had so we, had, we got banned from shrewsbury because i think it might have been because the stoke right the historia got smashed up that time when it didn't turn up i mean yeah like the fans it was great we went to some great gigs man it's, it's, it's a lot of fun yeah the lemon tree and in, in aberdeen got smashed up and a lot of people got arrested yeah there was it was um it was um it was mad it was it was mad it was great and the, you know the the further you went up north the more excitable because we're all spoilt down here and if you can you know not yeah mostly north i mean we did go out to Froome, but as you got no, cuz bands don't go up to dundee and they don't go up to aberdeen i don't think they kind of stop at maybe glasgow and possibly edinburgh so when you got there those scots are excited <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, as you go out of the country, like further away from sort of London and Birmingham, and you know, and obviously fans play Manchester and all that. But um, yeah, some great, great. It could you couldn't have more. You know, it was, it was a big come down. Like it took me years to come down off that. So exciting uh, to you know just wake up in a new city, do it, and then put on another amazing show. You know, I don't know if you've seen the Max Carlish thing, and there's like it's kicking off there. You know, it was right. It was a lot of fun. It's exciting. I love all that aggro. It's great. <laughs> you know, Telford kicked off there, kicked off all over the place. Great. In a good way, all good natured. Do you know what I mean? But it was it was crazy. It was good. It was mad times. And then driving back, you know, and then, and then we did the four gigs on New Year's Eve that I don't know if you know that one. We did we booked four shows in, in on New Year's Eve, maybe 2005. And uh, the enemy said it's impossible. <laughs> well, we got it done <laughs> we got it done i rented some mercedes i've never rented a car it's the fastest car i've ever driven i was doing 150 on the m1 in that car um wow. uh, and um yeah and we, we we just peaked doing acoustic shows and we did i don't know what it was birmingham stoke i don't know manchester so we did got the four shows done and starting at maybe 8 39 in the evening and the last show was a uh, one o'clock in the morning but we got round we had to pay we turned up late somewhere and he only had 15 minutes to go so i paid the guy a grand to give us 10 more minutes or something <laughs> and uh you know what i mean to get get make sure everybody got a little bit of a show um uh but yeah pulled it off it was exciting that's exciting hammering round. let's be real hi uh uh you know um pulling stuff like that off it's a lot of fun with someone to have a huge amount of respect for and you know it was it was, it was a good very 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 interesting character yeah do you have like what were your, your ambitions at the time was it just kind of 
I don't know, just seeing where it took you kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I guess I've never been a five-year plan kind of guy. So, um, um, I've never had a role model, you know, and then and then I really got into Andrew Lou Golden. You know who that is? I heard the name, yeah. Yeah, he's the Stones, uh, original Stones oh, okay, guy. Right. And um, he's an interesting cat. And I went, I've been to a, I saw Jeff Travis there, funny enough, and we kind of knew each other. He, he did a talk in South by Southwest in, in Austin one time to Andrew Lou Golden. It was great. And, um, and he was sort of my first ever role model at 30 years old. And um, so I didn't really have ambitions. I'm more of a sort of, sort of just wing it kind of guy. But it's funny because Andrew Lou Golden said two things that really stuck with me. He said, um, and this is a beautiful quote, and it doesn't really apply now because we're in different times, I guess, with, with you know, the rise of sort of urban like music, hip hop and that. But he said, the day you order room service, your creative career is over, <laughs> which, you know, is ultimately saying you're not singing about what people can relate to. Obviously, we, we have the whole genre of aspirational music now, so it's, <laughs> it doesn't really work anymore. But I don't think music pop music was aspirational so much back in the day in that material way but the other thing he says uh the other thing he said and i've quoted that to a lot of people and uh, and because uh, i loved it so much but the other thing he said was the day the management are taking more drugs than the band you've got a problem but i didn't i learned i heard it but i didn't i didn't internalize what that meant it's like i could quote that whilst getting high and really not engaged with what he's saying there and you know it was a, it was um it was it was it was it was yeah it was it wasn't the most insightful sort of uh rendition of a quote <laughs> i guess that's where i'm putting it but yeah i don't get sorry i don't know what you asked but yeah that's, <laughs> that's what i said but yeah no you what you're saying you were saying my plan no it was just going with it and you know what I thought if I was with Pete and I fought for Peter and um, and I promoted him to my to the best of my ability and had his interest in heart, like I said, we could go anywhere. That's where I was. That was my plan. So, you know, like I said, Prime Minister, you know, in retrospect, I mean, now we've had Boris Johnson, anything goes, right? But at, the True, time, yeah. at the time, maybe his, you know, his history wouldn't have allowed him, but maybe now you get a pass. But, um, but um, yeah, that, that was the plan, just going with it, because it was things were opening up. You know, I'd been doing my little label just on the scene and things were opening up. And, you know, it's a theme in my life that I've had great opportunities by just, you know, by just doing, uh, you know, just doing what I do and, and it takes me so far unfettered being myself. I've realized there's a limit. There's sort of like a ceiling to that, but um, which I'm working on in my now in my fifties. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but um, yeah, that was the plan. Yeah, just 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 try. You know, just um, just um, just promote. You know, it's promote the cult of Pete. I don't know. That's kind of like a. One way of putting it, but no, I don't know if I necessarily cult, but um, I guess cultish. I, yeah, I guess cultish because I have thought of him uh, in terms of Alistair Crowley at times. Uh, you know, a powerful personality that can lead people beyond their own instinctive boundaries. And when people are led beyond their own instinctive boundaries, they find themselves. Uh, in, a tr in a situation that causes them distress, do you know what I mean? And I think that's fair to say about pe people are drawn to charisma, and don't know when to let go of the mane of that that powerful evocative horse that's riding them off somewhere, and then get dropped off in a desert, <laughs> dehydrate. You know what I mean? If no, it's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, you know, and, and I think that's happened to a number of people around him. Do you know what I mean? Over, you know. Obviously, I don't know his recent times, but um, back in the day, yeah, you know, and it's right, and it's just power. So in that sense, cult, you know, cult, 
you know, a, a, a cult, cult of personality. Mm. Mm. And like, what was a bit of a general question, but what were the biggest challenges in making sure things were going to happen at the time, like making sure tours and, and gigs were going to happen? Well, you see, that's interesting as well, because, you know, if you wrote a book on how to how to grow yourself in any prof- profession that they, you know, we could all come up with turn up on time, you know, be polite, uh, you know, this socially sort of like there's a social contract we all enter into and we believe that, you know, as I understand it. And I, I was very tempted to try and like get Pete to operate within the contract that we all, you know, generally works with. But the thing with Pete was, whatever he did seemed to get better for him. So it's very hard to tell someone to adhere to my rules or what I believe the social, you know, dynamic was when, you know, he could do what the hell he wanted and he got better. So <laughs> and things went better. So, you know, and then especially, you know, it was tough because when you're in that situation, there's a lot of people around the eyes who don't really have their best, whether, you know, did I have his best interest in heart? I like to think so. People, you know, in the twisted world where I was encouraging to take, not encouraging, but definitely not trying to dissuade him properly from taking class A drugs. It was an environment where that was all part of it. Um, So, you know, his mum might say that's definitely not having his best interest in heart. And I wouldn't argue with her if, if she made that argument, but, on a daily basis, putting that aside, um, uh, I feel like I, I was I was closer to being aligned with what his best interests were, in, you know, naively. But um, um, and so when everybody's telling him, uh, you know, blowing smoke up someone's ass, it's hard to make him turn up, you know, you know, he got bigger and bigger, you know. We had it. What was it? It's like supporting Oasis in Southampton. I flew to Paris to drag him out of bed, and he wouldn't get out of damn bed. And we didn't. Like, I booked a private plane to get that guy back there on time. He wouldn't get out of bed. And um, did it damage his career? Ultimately, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? But it, it, you know, it was part of his character, wasn't it? So I don't know. Some people shine different, right? And um, and the guy's who he is, and that's this, uh, and it's you know, for better or for worse, that's 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 the path the guy's trod, and that's cool, man. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. Pat and Adam talked about that Oasis thing, saying they I think they were stuck on the bus or something. Well, yeah, I didn't know that you actually went to Paris to try and get him. That's mad. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I couldn't help but think, Kate wasn't on board with his career so much at the time do you know what I mean like she was not a girlfriend kicking him out of bed saying Colin you need to go to work definitely not and there was a weird dynamic but um yeah it was strange uh but um yeah the band had to be patient and um it was interesting because you know for all Peter's great qualities um You know, I'm not a huge fan of Star Wars in the modern era, but I used to be a massive fan of Star Wars in the initial era. And I, if I was to make a Star Wars analogy, I would say he he chose the dark side of the Force. You know, um, you know, you had to put up with some bullshit to be around Peter, and he didn't really respect people that put up with his bullshit. Uh, so it was a very strange, but I, you know, at one point, and I strangely now think I have lived that to some extent, but I would used to say of him that it's almost like he surrounded himself with people he didn't truly respect. And I'm not labeling any particular person, but as a broad stroke, um, but Peter surrounded himself with a load of characters who, who were just there to hang off him. And therefore, you could expect no loyalty from. So you could not be let down by them. And 
whether that's purely what it was, but I've definitely, you know, since then I've I've definitely done similar things, and I, I could, you know, it's it's yeah, I, and I do think that, you know what I mean? You get you get you get, you can't expect, you know, that I'm surrounded by people who don't will not give me loyalty, therefore I cannot be hurt, and you know what I mean? I I definitely think that's something you know Peter Peter did. So, um, but you know whether he would a, a, a acknowledge that I don't know. So, um, but yeah, you know, one illustration was he'd had um. He'd had an implant, um, uh, naloxone implant, I think, it, or naltrexone implant. Um, you know, and they put this thing, and it slowly dissolves, and you can't take opiates. And um, he had all these cronies around him, and I, you know, some people might say I'm a crony. That's fair enough. And I turned. He was at Jill's, and I turned up there, and I'd heard that it had got infected. And so I went round there one night. And these lot are all sitting around laughing as he's squeezing like these huge amounts of pus and stuff out of this thing. You know, it's it's a it's an incision, a surgical incision in your sort of abdomen, I guess, roughly where you know, like appendix might be. I mean, it looked disgusting, and they're all just sitting around laughing. I was like, well, "Why haven't any of you called me?" And they're all fucking bunch of idiots. Anyway, so I, you know, I got a doctor around and, and sorted it out. So you know what I mean. So I don't know, man. You know what I mean. You're rotting in front of their very eyes and they don't give a shit as long as you're buying stuff. Do you know what I mean? So, but as I say, strangely, I at a later time I followed that same path. Not quite as um not quite as, you know, as clearly illustrated as that moment, but um broadly speaking, yeah. But yeah, so I don't know, yeah, no, it's, um again, I I have no idea what I was answering. <laughs> did it answer anything or did it like, shut up it's definitely interesting um but yeah uh, another point was like i think you said that there wasn't loads of money kicking about at one point and that you would come up with like different ideas like you mentioned the max carlish documentary and i think celebrity big brother was on the cards at one point yes that, it was yeah that that true, was. yeah yeah celebrity big brother no that was that was quite interesting because yeah, I think they offered 150 grand. Because, yeah, I, I can't remember the order of things. It might have, was it, I don't know if you know, it was either before or after. I think it was after he got released from jail after the um, the stuff with Carl. And we had to put up that sorority. I can't remember anyway, but there was, yeah, 150 grand. And I knew a, I knew a sort of summary of And my plan was, because the agreement was he didn't have to stay in there any period of time. He just had to go in. And there was no like, you know, there's no like you have to be there a week because or two weeks or whatever. So the, my plan was that he, we were going to get a prosthetic mask made of Carl and he, <laughs> lunatic, and he would go in, you know, Peter Doherty, and then he goes in and pretends to be Carl for as long as he can be bothered and then just walk out again and pick up the 150 grand. <laughs> Which, that was the plan, but then he decided he didn't want to do it. So, um, but you know, fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, no, so it would have been an interesting. It would have been, it would have been unusual. Would it have been interesting? Who knows? But Pete's quite a good actor, and I'm, you know, him and Carl know each other very well, so I'm sure he could have, he could have impersonated Carl really well, which might have <laughs> been quite funny. <laughs> I think you said something like, "There's an idea that he'd have 15 minutes." three times a day off camera as well that he proposed to Channel 4 or something. I don't know that one. But I don't yeah. know. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. It's, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah who, who knows? Yeah, there was lots of those, like, you know, there was, there was the, what was his name? The Italian guy. Um, Jeff Roselli. And he, he, Pete had sold him some rights to something. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was something to do with the film that Roger, because I've never seen it. Was there a film by Roger Pomfrey ever completed? Yeah, the Who the Who the Fuck is Doc, Pete Dockett? Oh, yeah. I've never seen it. You see, I think it might have been linked to that. Greg Roselli, and it was quite funny because there was a bit of beef about that. And anyway, I think the band were at the, the three... Three something, three valleys, three peaks studio in Monmouth at the time. So it's up in the 
Bracken Beacons or the Black Mountains up in Wales. And I went up there with this guy, Greg, and we'd, I'd had a bit of beef and we sorted it out. And then he had to go and get Peter to sign this thing. And um, anyway, we park up on a mountain. I just remember it being really dark. And it was, I don't know if you've been in Wales. It rains a lot in Wales, right? And it's like at night, it's raining. And we, he, some reason he pulls up and we just start talking, this guy. And he's, he's explaining to me that, that he's, you know, I kind of knew he was like Italian-American guy. You can see where this is going to go. Comes from Chicago. And now his grandmother was the, or his great-grandmother was the only female in Capone's inner circle. And his brother, who is a dentist, I don't know if you've ever seen Casino. And I don't know if this is bullshit. I never checked out. But he did have a Roselli. He showed me that he did end up showing me the book about Capone. And there was a female called Roselli who was his only in his inner circle. So um, in his inner circle. So and he was and we were sitting on this mountain. I just had it like we'd had like a quite a powerful disagreement about this money that he was giving Pete because I thought he'd been really sneaky about it. And um and um, and he's telling me that there's a scene in the Casino where two guys get clubbed to death in a cornfield. It's a long time since I've seen it, and they're like, they're supposed to be two gangsters, but apparently the two gangsters ran off and like was smart. And these were two like you know people. I won't use the word irrelevant because that's really cruel because they're human beings, but other people. And his brother faked the dental. Anyway, the point of the story is. So I'm sitting there listening to all this and I'm thinking, we're parked up a mountainside. We've been in, you know, you've suddenly become a lot more easy going about this situation. And I'm sitting in a mountainside in Wales and you're telling all this. And I thought, yeah, this ain't this ain't good situation. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out Greg turned out to be a good guy. Well, good guy, yeah. I don't mean probably. He did get the UK rights to bum fights, so don't know if that makes him a good guy or not. But I don't know if you remember bum fights. You might no, I think good. so. Yeah, yeah. He's, anybody who's promoting bum fights, don't know if they can necessarily be called a good guy. But, <laughs> but yeah, great, great. Yeah, that was cool. And um, but yeah, I think it might. But there was lots of there was lots of little opportunities, and it wasn't that there wasn't a lot of money about. It's just how quickly it can get spent. Do you right, know what I mean? Because yeah. like, because once I started working with Peter, I was earning more money than I ever earned in my life. Let's make that very clear. Even in the early days, you know, when we were green vanning it, we would do a show and, you know, because there was four in the band and me and we and 20 percent of the manager. So we'd split it five ways and I'd get 800 quid for a night's work. That was a lot of money, even in the very earliest of days. So, you know, do a show at Brixton Academy. Everyone put 20 grand in their pocket, you know, so let's not say there wasn't a lot of money about. It was just getting spent very quickly. So Pete was picking up, you know, it's relative, isn't it? So, yeah, it was uh, earning a hell of a lot of money and spending every penny of it very quickly. And um, so Pete was picking up money in little like, little things, or, you know, did something with Gio Goy up in Manchester, which were a bunch of colourful characters, uh, you know, um, all sorts of things. So, yeah, I, yeah, I don't... There wasn't a lot of money left. That's <laughs> a better way of putting it. Although it wasn't a good chunk of money being earned. <laughs> um, and you mentioned Max Carlish. Like, how would you reflect on all that kind of thing? That's quite funny because I seem to be the slight fall guy for that. And that's fair enough. But he was introduced to me by a guy called Nathan. I've forgotten Nathan's surname, but he was the Happy Mondays manager at one point. Nathan, I've forgotten his name now. So he had some legitimate sort of credentials and Sean McCluskey, who I used to be in a little label with, he used to do one, two, three, four with me and um and Percy. And um and he was in Nathan McGough. And he'd been Happy Mondays manager, so he had a track record and he introduced Max as an old friend of his. And um so that's how Max got through the door. And then, you know, it's like then you have this some weird, weird mission creep or something. And then he just turns into a complete, like, clingy lunatic. But he was he was just another character on a cast of characters. 
Do you know what I mean? And uh, and ultimately, right? I'm actually glad Max made his film. Do you know what I mean? And he was, yeah, it, yeah. It wasn't the most managed experience, but you know, there's some, there's some, there's some gem moments that he's got. And I bet, he, I bet, if he got all Max's rushes, um, there would be some more gems on there. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know what's happened to the guy, but um. I've still, I've still got an African birthing stool. He gave me. All right. <laughs> so I do think of Max from time to time. It's in my kitchen, sort of where you stick stuff like the mop bucket and all that, and the Hoover. But um, there's a, there's a birthing. He told me it's a birthing stool. It might just be a three-legged little stool with beads. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so I, I do think of Max. Bless him. And you know, and there was all that exciting stuff with the sword and. The assault and the rookery and all that. So you know, he's he's an you know, he was a definite character. And ultimately, you know, let's be fair. You know, Max wasn't Max was a loving guy, right? And he was treated more cruelly than he ever treated anybody else. You know, he was treated quite nastily a lot of times, and it was his resilience to being treated like a complete mug that allowed him to get that footage. Because he would be, you know, he'd turn up in, he'd be invited to Wolverhampton. He'd turn up there and then he'd just get abused and told to fuck off by whoever. And um, and he would take it and he'd turn up the next day. And in a lot of ways, that's dedication. So madness meets madness, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, but, you know, respect to him. And there's some good moments, you know what I mean? I mean I mean, stalking Pete Doherty. I mean, it's, it was a stalking <laughs> Pete Doherty. Yeah, we did um do like a series on Patreon. Like, did we did like a deep dive into the documentary? It's quite it's quite good going through it. Oh right, yeah, yeah. I have to see it again. <laughs> yeah, I have to see it again. Oh, I, did, I did. I did actually put it on YouTube, but I got a. Uh, I think Max got it taken down, so I don't know if he's. Oh, it copyright struck it. Yeah, and then I got an email saying. This Max Carlish is this yes claim this you need to take it down. I was like, fair enough. <laughs> That's a little bit grabby, Max. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Let's face it. That's a little bit grabby. Right. If I ever see him, I'll, I'll give him his damn birth and stuff back. <laughs> I don't want to have a grabby man. <laughs> um but was he someone that was promising money at the end of it? Was that the idea? Or not really? I don't think it was a money thing. No, it was the idea of, I'd been into a guy called, I think it was Bob Gruen. And he was a guy who would hang around the early punk scene in New York. And there'd just been a film come out of his that I saw somewhere down on the South Bank. And it was great footage of the New York Dolls and Blondie, uh, all these sort of characters. And it's some amazing, like, you know, like, just loose backstage, just natural footage. And I was really into it at the time. And then I think just about then he came and um, turned up and I thought, wow, you know, let's, let's, we're going down this route. And I just was like, you know, it's great to see, you know, just getting, because you've got to remember now it's slightly different. Um, there wasn't a cam, phones cameras, you know, then it was just before that. Obviously we had mobile phones, but they weren't the powerful sort of multimedia tools that they are today. So, you know, there was a lot less nowadays, every moment of, you know, of, of most people's lives, you know, gets caught or any publicly consumed. You're not going to be backstage now, I'm sure, without someone filming. But back then, it wasn't like that. So, you know, to get all that footage, because it can be lost, you know, and then you get, you get, because it's, you see all these moments that are so beautiful get lost in time and it's great you know when you see you know funny enough we're talking about a label as someone posted justin posted uh of the of the one two three four offices there was um he was a character around there he was a fit so he came in and, he, and i don't even remember him coming in with cameras but he must have had like um a mini dv kind of camera which was a you know it's a tape the size of a pack of well not quite the size of a pack of cigarettes uh but um and um, and he, got, he had all this footage of our office, and it, it was amazing. It was so moving to see it. Everybody looks young, and it just looked like if you were looking at, uh, you know, fact footage from factory records back from, 
you know, a decade earlier and it looked so good and it's like a hustle and everybody's in it. He's got this track that he put out uh, or that he made at the time. I don't remember it. Because it was like, um, I had a very, very strange dream last night was the sort of tagline. And then all these people, you know, Mick Whitnell was in it. Dave was in it who worked there. Lily was in it. Uh, Sean's in it. Alan, uh, Alan Wass, God rest his soul, it was in it. The great set, I'm in it. Um, yeah, Percy's, you know, all the characters back then. It's just the office. And it was amazing seeing that I didn't know it existed. And it was so amazing to see. And, you know, it's... It was, you know, it was, they were good times and, you know, and long answer, but Max was just part of that. And, you know, now we take it all for granted, but back then it wasn't. And, um, you know, Anne McCloy, who used to do the merch, she used to be a camera guy, but she's got some amazing footage. And the footage I really want to see is there was a character who used to hang about, oh, what's his damn name? Ronnie, I don't remember what his surname is, but he used to film us live. And I remember seeing something, and he's a really, I thought his rushes were amazing, and I don't think anybody's ever seen them. And I went to see him once about it, and I don't, I was still kind of not thinking straight, and I don't know what's happened to Ronnie, but he's got a ton of footage of, of Baby Shambles live, and it's like, he was a good cameraman. He used to get great footage. So the all Ronnie's stuff is out there. Uh, and Anne McCloy got, he got, yeah, I don't know. I've never looked through all his footage, so I don't know what he's got. But Anne used to do the tour bus. There'll be some great stuff there. And, you know, and I guess, and I guess it was, you know, in a lot of ways, you see, that's the thing. If someone weren't prepared to turn up with a camera and film everything was, was they were doing a service back then. Do you know what I mean? So it's, you know, yeah, so, oh, great. Some of the, and, and in the context of me seeing this Bob Gruen and wanting that, then, oh, this guy's up for filming. So it seemed like a good idea. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was what it was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know what I mean? Long answer, sorry. No, that's all right. <laughs> you see, it's funny because I think I was speaking to Gemma not long ago and she said she used to, like, either her or uh, someone in the family used to take a lot of footage as well and she's got, she's got that sat at home. So that'd be cool to see at one at one point as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gemma will have some guys. I didn't really know Gemma was uh, uh, involved in Tame Fridge, but I'm sure I'm sure she's got some good stuff because yeah, she'd have had some access. But yeah, it was, yeah, straight, yeah. You know, just thinking about you know, we'd used to get people like we'd be driving down the road after a gig, and then like someone would emerge from somewhere, like they'd be hiding a bunk, some young girl or something who, you know, then wouldn't get off the tour bus. And, you know, and they'd be halfway down the motorway or, you know what I mean? It's fair enough. Why would you even want to be there? You know, like <laughs> if you're getting on with someone, right, fair enough, come for a ride, you know, and we'll work it out. We used to have to, like, pull in the services, like, give them 100 quid, call a taxi and say, could you take them home? It's like, why do you want to be here? You're not talking to anybody. Like, oh, what no, do you mean, I, I, I believe me, I'm socially awkward. So I'm not hating on anybody who doesn't talk to anybody, but... You're putting yourself through hell, darling, <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> so, you know, just weird stuff. And I remember one time there was some kidnap story. It was just loads of mental. It was like mad stuff. Tons of mad stories, man. It was a lot of fun. Cheers <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, for time, mate. I'll just fire through some, some last ones for you. Okay. Um, Sorry, we haven't even really got... Have, we, have I just been talking for two hours? No, it's brilliant, mate. Honestly, okay. it's great. Cool, cool. I feel like I um, stuff to do. <laughs> just more, a few more from the book, really. Just like there's oh, one cool. about. Oh, yeah, whatever you need. Um, there's one about you set, you set up a deal with the son to pay, to actually pay Pete's bail at one point. Is that true? That's right. We did. Um, that's right. I think, I don't know if they did, did they do come up with 25 grand? There was definitely a deal and he had to leave prison that's right we got picked up i can't remember exactly the details but i was with the guy from the newspaper and we picked him up at they brought him out the side door of pentonville and it was funny and we were parked across there because we didn't want any um they he obviously they wanted absolute exclusive so we parked up the road and then we got a call that he was leaving and we literally just drove as he come out the gate, he jumped in the car and then they came and did it actually at the BBQ office down in Old Street. 
and the deal yeah and the deal was i can't remember exactly but yeah they yeah that was the deal they got an exclusive interview uh the minute he got out and they paid his bail yeah that's the sure answer but that is a true story i could confirm yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know i suppose yeah i suppose that that's because that was very early days that we were still dealing with all the stuff to do with you know the separation from the you know there's so there's so much to tell on the story i'd, I'd have to read some people's books because there's there's lots of really interesting stories uh, like to do with the business of the libertines business of, anyway rah, rah, rah. but yeah that that was yeah the rough trade weren't very helpful in any sense legally or anything to protect their artists at that point we had to hustle like you know respect them that they managed to come up with a 50 grand surety one time for something uh not that they paid it they you know what they even brought they even told Peter that they bought his mum some flowers for well, Peter was in jail. Well, they bought his mum some flowers on Mother's Day and um uh and you know took loads of bloody kudos for it. When I got the long form uh, you know, when I took over, I went through the long form accounting. Those fucking flowers were charged back, you know. <laughs> And that's just there's a we could go into the long form accounting that I received that day, but that's just one illustrative thing. Do you know what I mean about like, oh, we bought your mum some flowers? Well, no, you didn't. I bought them, and you arranged it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> slightly different language? Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, that's, that's interesting. But anyway, yeah, he did. The son, the son did pay for that. Yeah. yeah, and you know, he does mention that you were best mates. Um for you know quite a while um and then it kind of came to a head when you can't think were you, were you given the blame for this uh for these photos getting sold to the newspaper he said like he said now he knows it wasn't you but at the time it was kind of landed it with you or something i wonder if peter will watch this i wonder who it was peter eh how about that i wonder who it was he yeah. said he he said he thinks it was um one of his one of his drug dealers basically but i don't know Let's not get into it. <laughs> Peter. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it was nothing to do with me. I knew nothing about it. That's right. And um, yeah, I'm, yeah. That's a slightly sore topic. It's interesting, but yeah, you, we don't have long, so you don't want another long story, do you? No, I've got, I've got as much time as you can give me. It's up to you. Okay, well, without getting into the ins and outs of that, yeah, that was a very, that was very tough for me, that actually. That was a... Yeah, that was a very that was a very tough experience in my life because, um, as I said, I felt very loyal to Pete, and I was very loyal to Pete, and um, it was confusing times because, as I said, I was trying. You know, I felt like I was trying. You know, I was trying to part what I thought was good moral or behavior, and surrounded by people who were telling me that's nonsense. It just whatever. You know, it's um. You know, so we were growing apart. I was trying to lead him one way. His behaviour was getting more kind of extreme and his, you know, uh, you know, less social, you know, less group. He wasn't so interested in the group. It was more about Pete and, you know, and that's cool. And, um, and um, yeah, and then I get the blame for this. It's, I mean, I said to Kate one time, She's looking at the person filming her. And I say, well, and I'm getting the blame for this. And I said, and I wasn't even there that night, let me tell you. And I say, well, who are you talking to right now? That is the person who filmed you. You're looking at the camera, three feet in front of you, you're talking to somebody. You're talking to the person who's holding the damn camera. And um, um, and yeah, I've, I don't, you know, it doesn't make sense that I got the blame for it. Uh, we, uh, we, Anybody involved knows what happened in that scenario. But um, but the point was, I, I, there's a guy called David Kelly, and he was, he was a scientist who uh, worked for the government. He was accused of leaking um, the, the, the weapons of mass destruction, something, something. And he ended up committing suicide. Some people think he was murdered. You know, let's not get into the conspiracy of it. Because he couldn't, he couldn't stand... Uh, being perceived as something so counter to how he considered his his sort of morality, and this was about a, you know nine months prior to this, and I 
And I thought at the time, I remember saying, why could you care so much what people think of you? And within a year, this happened. And that is not me at all. And, you know, let me tell you something, right? They got paid 150 grand for that footage. We all know it. I was offered 200, and after I got blamed for it, the mirror offered me 240 grand to tell my story. And I still turned it down because Pete's my mate and I don't sell my mates out. And I knew who the fuck I was. Sorry to swear on your podcast. But, you know, to say I sold you out for 150 grand, that's, that was not cool. And all my friends that I put around it all turned away from me. Everybody around here, Matt Bates, uh, Asm, uh, and everybody around him, I put in around him, the whole mechanism and everybody, um, the, you know, all the, all the business turned their back. I and mean, it was really hard. It was very, very hard time. And, and I, I understood, um, then I understood uh, how painful it can be to be perceived as someone you truly don't think you are. And I'm not, you know, I'm far from being a perfect human being. Don't get me wrong. But, um, uh, yeah, rightly or wrongly, I feel, you know, I, I, I'm pretty lost. So it was, that was a very tough. And you know what? Someone, t I was in South Africa last year and uh, someone over there had a friend in England they, and they told that they'd read the book and they said he'd sort of, you know, said he knows it was nothing to do with me now. And that was 15 years. And I do appreciate Pete kind of saying that, although, you know, maybe we'll sit down and have a cup of tea and talk about it one day. But yeah, but yeah, I do appreciate that because yeah, it was absolutely nothing to do with me. So that's very kind of him to say. So, you know, I years later, I might be in, in Milan, and then I'll be talking to someone. They go, oh, you're the guy who fucked over P and K, aren't you? And I'm, you know, and that, you know, to be internationally known as a, like a real, and how can you work, you know, the reason I couldn't work in the music industry was not solely because of that. I'd done a lot of bridge burning for whatever reason, but it's hard to get artists to trust you when that's your reputation. And, and you know, there's a lot of reasons, you know, I'll own up to who I am as best I can. You know, we can all have a bit of delusion or sort of deep rooted denial as to who we are. I know I can anyway. And, um, but boy, God forbid you accuse me of something I'm not. <laughs> I don't say <laughs> that well. And I think, and I know I've had it since I was a kid, but yeah, that is, that, that is a very, that's a very big moment in my life, that thing. And, uh, that thing with that. And, uh, you know, and it took, it took me quite a long while to go get get past it. Do you know what I mean? But um, but yeah. Anyway, sorry. That's a crazy. You're always going to get a long answer to that one. No, it's <laughs> good, man. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting stuff. And then something we don't have to talk about it, but I did. I did see. Was it right that you were? Uh, it was found that your phone was being hacked as well. Yes, it was. Yeah, that was Andy Coulson, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think Pete got paid out on that, and. Uh, I I gave a couple of other once I saw it my yeah it was yeah it was it was yeah it was yeah um, but it was funny because at the time we were very suspicious something was weird was going on with our phones something there was like a something odd going on but I don't know to why I think the extent of it was further than just hacking into voicemails but but yeah it's you know it was funny because um the story the, about that is. I get a letter one day and I open it up and it says Operation Pine Tree. And of course, at the time, Operation Yew Tree was running. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? And it was a letter from the Metropolitan Police Serious Crimes. And I was like, and it said, and it went, rah, rah. I think it opened with, don't worry, you're not in trouble. And then, and then it went on to say, we found your number in, um, you know, so and so's um a thing and we believe your phone's been hacked, you know, please get in touch. But it was, yeah, it was like to get a to get a letter from the Metro and Police Serious Crimes with a sort of quite an unpleasant tree reference. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I had to Google what it was because I was thinking, my God, what's this? But um, yeah. But um, yeah, no, that, that you know um if I'm I suppose it's finished, so be totally honest i mean yeah it's an invasion of privacy and uh and uh and there's rules around that and you know i don't want to get in the great politics of it but it was resolved amicably 
from my point of view. Except for I don't think I ever got the apology that um, uh, was part of the settlement. So um, I don't think that was ever published, but I might follow that up. But, um, but, um, but yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, maybe. It could, yeah, I mean, if I think about it, uh, it might have had bad implications. I mean, it definitely contributed to the sort of non-trustworthiness, possibly, if, like, information that I'm party to uh, ends up in papers. So, mm. yeah. Anyway. But, yeah, so, yeah, it was hacked. It was hacked, yeah. And there was plenty of evidence to it. You know, the, the technique they use for doing it, when you get all the phone logs, it's very clear a uh, 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 behaviour is, 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 um, is being repeated by someone at, at, within their offices, so yeah. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> and then he said it was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a calm down after, after all that. Like, what's been your journey since then? Like, what, yeah, what was the fallout from everything? Um. Well, I suppose I touched on that. Um. Uh, you know, with the stuff, you know about you know it was tough it was tough man it was tough it was it was a big come because it was a huge ego rush and i'm i'm you know hopefully less vulnerable to that now but um um it it felt good at, you know doing that and uh, 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 it was fun uh, uh very high um and i woke up one morning totally skinned with a big, um, like, class A drug habit with no career left. And um, that was a wake up that morning. And, uh, yeah, with no money in the bank. And because, um, you know, and not one year earlier than that, I thought, God, I've cracked life now. You know, I was 35, you know, I've done various things, but that, you know, that was the peak. And I thought I cracked, absolutely cracked life. So, um Rightly or wrongly, but to wake up one morning and realise, you know, I've, I may have cracked life, but now I've totally fucked it up, uh, was a bit of a come down. You know, I didn't listen to music, you know. So, you know, if the truth, you know, if I'm telling the true story, I didn't. I don't think I listened to music for seven years after. I just didn't believe because, and you know, now I look at it slightly differently. But I felt hard done to at the time because of what went down over that Kate thing. But you know. I left myself, you know, I now realise, you know, I, I I put myself in a position for that to happen. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, like, my behaviour, you know, uh, may have, cat well, no doubt catalyzed it. But um, but I felt a little bit hard down to it, and I didn't believe in, I didn't believe in musicians anymore. I didn't believe, like, the lyrics were bullshit. Talk one game, you know, it's kind of naive again, but I'm like, not alive, quite black or white thinking, which isn't very helpful. So I, it's only over the last couple of years I've even started really listening to me. I, you know, I go into places and think, oh, it's nice to have a, you know, an environment with music, but I didn't contextualize anything with music. I just didn't like gone off it when, you know, the journey into, you know, that period was all about absolute absorption in, you know, listening to music and, and, uh, you know, buying records and uh, being into bands and going out and all that. So, you know, now as opposed, you know, life's very different as a, as a, you know, I've I've been an, a heroin addict and crack addict for the majority of the time since then. Uh, I became an addict. Uh, I was a drug user uh, when we did that, but that's when I first became addicted to heroin. So I spent a lot of time addicted to heroin. Now I'm totally clean now. I don't do anything, but. Um, Spent a lot, a lot of time addicted. So chasing some, chasing, I think, chasing that buzz that we used to have, trying to look for that buzz. And the problem is it's only getting clean. I realized that I could chase it as long as I want, but it was drugs on top of experience created the buzz. Sitting in a crack house with a load of toothless homeless people stinking and fucking piss. It doesn't matter how much crack you smoke, you're not going to get the buzz because it's just not as much fun. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> and, you know, uh, um, so, yeah, no, it was a mistake, you know, a mistake chasing that buzz because it was exciting. You know, I, I liken it, you know, not that I've, I've been in the military, but I've not been SAS, but, you know, this sort of depression of a special forces guy, like they can't get that buzz anymore. It was like special forces fun. 
Do you know what I mean? Doing that, it was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, you know, and charged on. Uh, so yeah, but but I'm good these days. You know, I've 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 had another career and messed that up since then. And I promised myself one day I've done art fabrication, um, you know, sculptural stuff for people for a, a number of years. I would built a good little business doing that, but um, it's funny because it's like again, what did I do when? Uh, I got successful and I and then I did exactly the same thing. I just sabotaged again. And uh, but yeah, but you know, uh, um, but it's good. It's good. It's good to be clean. It's good to see the world differently. It's good. And um, yeah, no, it's a journey, man. I mean, they, I, I trust me. I love telling stories. So um, you know, could have done. If you could do a few hours of some great stories. That's what I mean. I don't know what's been said. I and. Um, yeah, there's there's some great stories associated with it. It was a bit, it was a great journey. It was a lot of fun. You know, I'm. Um, it's funny because it's it's like, it was like a journey. It was a great journey that I had for all the wrong reasons. That's how I look at it now. Do you know what I mean? But I'm glad to have done it. Um. um yeah, and it was a great opportunity, and I'm grateful to Peter for giving me, you know, he gave me an opportunity that I was ill qualified for and he gave, and it was great. And, and yeah, it was, I was very close to the guy and, um, and um, yeah, it was, it was a great, it was a, it was a great time. And, you know, um, because I haven't followed it. Are there any, are there classic baby shambles songs now? I mean, there's classic libertines. I don't know what is, and I, I hope there's, you know, there's some music worth listening to there as uh, time goes by. I don't know if any Baby Shambles songs are going to... Um, I always wanted Peter to make a song, and it was it was funny. He was in... He was in... He was in um, Pentonville, and he was buying drugs in there, and I was paying for them, I know, but let's face it, they all know what's going on in there. And I was... And I'd, I've seen since that someone's got busted for it, but it used to, I have to pay someone the outside and I would pay it the amount with the room number in pence or the, there was some that somewhere <laughs> you added that it was like 50, 50 quid, 16 P and it somehow I remember it signified who you were paying and I've seen them bust anyway. And I was getting these calls to pay this money. You know, it was like a hundred pound every couple of days. And I, I started becoming suspicious that um, I don't believe you anymore. So I said, ask Peter what my favorite song is. And um, they came back with the right answer. And so I knew it was, it's not a song he's ever put out. It was a song about, I've been so long ago now, but it's, uh, I can't remember. It was something about it won't happen again. It was like an apology song. It was so beautiful. I can't remember. I can't believe he's never finished it. I can't remember what the first word is, but yeah. And but it was so, it's such a beautiful song because you you know you play that song and you give your girlfriend a bunch of flowers, and play that song. I mean, she's going to take you back at least a couple of times. <laughs> 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 or you know, or your mum or whoever. It was so it was so great. I can't remember how it went out, but at the time I could. You know, it's, it's a lot of years ago now, isn't it? It's probably it's close to twenty years. Thirteen. Uh, sorry, close to 20 years, 18, 19 years ago, so it's a long time. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so um, yeah, I can't remember. I, it's like I'm a terrible um, segwayer, but, um, <laughs> and that's not a, an electric vehicle. It's a <laughs> conversational uh, inadequacy. I don't know, or, or a characteristic, conversational characteristic. But yeah. Um, I recently yeah. bought the... Uh... I recently bought the record again off uh, from the internet, so it's been good going through it. Like Fuck Forever is a great, great. What's song. that? Fuck Forever is obviously. Yeah, Fuck Forever. Album, yeah, but I never hear. I see. I hear. I hear. You know, don't look back into the sun a lot. But I've, I don't. I like Fuck Forever. You know, that's. Um, uh, I suppose Kilimanjaro yeah. is the more radio friendly one, wasn't it? Yeah, it's not quite so profound though, right? Nah, yeah, I do prefer. But no, the record, I always thought the production on Kilimanjaro was great though. Right, yeah, well, you know who you know who did that, don't you? Epworth, that was, uh, was it? Yeah, yeah, Epworth, and 
What's Emma's gone on to do? <laughs> yeah, no, it's done, you know, and what a beaut and I will say this right now, what a lovely person. And no man deserves what they've got more than Paul Epworth. Do you know what I mean? What a great yeah, guy. Yeah. He, he, he document. He, he recorded a day. He used to work early days in 93. There used to be a club. I don't know if it's still there. 93 feet east on Brick Lane. And they used to have a little recording studio there. And he was the studio engineer there. And we did a white sports session in there, right? And Pat, I think time was running. And Pat played, it was six songs. And he did the lead guitar and played it straight through on six songs. And it's, I think that might be my greatest moment in a recording studio ever. It's absolutely magical. Him, he just did like straight through and just played it without stopping at the six. And it was, uh, you know, uh, it, was, it was some amazing playing to watch that guy do that. And yeah, that was uh, recorded it. And um, yeah, a lovely guy. And yeah, we did kind of drive with him. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, over in somewhere in up from Wood uh, Wood Lane, isn't it? Somewhere over there, west. On the... Yeah, because it's in the in the Max Callis documentary. He makes his way in to those sessions, I think. Where the graveyard is and all that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, is that that's yeah? Because I was sitting there thinking, was it Kilimanjaro? It was. Yeah. Let's start that session. Yeah. That's right. Up the stairs, and he definitely peered in and got his camera in briefly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was. He knew where it was. Yeah. That's it. But yeah, that's um. Yeah. He's he's yeah. He's gone. He's done great, and that's that's great. Good old uh, Paul Epworth. Yeah. Cool cat man. I haven't seen him a lot of time, but um, lots of love to him. Did you have to manage relationships? Mike's gone a bit weird. Um, did you have to manage some relationships like that? Because I think in the book, Pete says you know he wasn't for some reason he didn't really click with Paul Epworth. Um, did you kind of have to like manage some of those relationships? I don't remember being present enough to do that. It's like stick him in the room and uh and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Cause I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't, cause did Pete get on? I don't know if Pete liked anybody uh, <laughs> I, I ever got him to record with. Him. I don't know. Did he click with Robert Harder? Did, did Baby Shams? Did he, he definitely didn't click with that guy. Who was that huge producer that did you too, that we got him to do a session with um, Nelly Hooper. I don't think oh, he liked right. Nelly. And you know, they never paid that. I'd see that. If anybody should have the hunt with anybody, Rough Trade never paid their bill at Nelly Hooper's, and he kept my um, my um, my Fender amp that that we they'd left there. It was like a two and a half grand bloody Fender amp. He wouldn't give me it back because he didn't pay the damn bill. So um, you know, I ended up paying for it after I'd left, and um, uh, he didn't like he didn't like the session with Nelly. Well, no, it probably wasn't the right guy anyway. Didn't get on with Paul then. Um. I suppose Mick did the, yeah, maybe he just liked working with Mick. Because mm -hmm. Mick was, you know, it's funny the whole Mick thing because I guess he let it be what it was more than anyone else maybe and just kept it loose, which probably suited Peter. But, um, yeah, whether it, yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, kept it, kept it, kept it loose. So whether that's, whether that is the best sound to take, but, you who knows yeah who knows but yeah no I mean, yeah Mick did his thing so uh... yeah yeah <laughs> and like yeah what what are you up to these days like how yeah what are you up to now in London I've got a little I've got my studio still where I make make things for people um yeah I'm just um I'm just uh just chilling just enjoying just enjoying I've got lots of little projects on the go you don't even want to hear it boring you know? <laughs> I've, I've, so I'm trying to start a shape running community, community at the moment um, it's a t-shirt I've just made there's loads of loads of projects yeah loads oh, of cool, yeah. Things. but it's just just cool yeah I was in South Africa last year uh, you know just um, haven't done work in any music based things uh, probably start working with artists again shortly uh, I've not been back long so um, uh, just just hanging out, it's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's great, like, talking Things to are good. No, it, for me, every day, no, I have my nut on cracking heroin is a good day. That's just, that's how I'm seeing it at the moment. Do you know what I mean? And having a sort of, like, just, like, 
and just to enjoy life. Watering plants is a beautiful thing. I had a great experience watering plants the other day. You know, it's just like enjoying it where it, where it happens. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I saw my friend Bonnie. It's funny, I saw my friend Bonnie the other time I went to her birthday and she was going to me, yeah, she was telling her friends that we hadn't seen each other for five years because the last birthday party she invited me to, she said, please bring vegetarian food. And I apparently I told a few people that I thought she was being controlled. She was being controlling, and I and we <laughs> fell out. She was joking. I was like, "Well, maybe." It sort of rings a bell. But so it's good to be able to not think someone's controlling because they want you to bring vegetarian food. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm enjoying stuff like that. But life's good. Yeah, things are good. But yeah, it's good to chat and bring you know chat about um uh yeah. But I did because I as I said I hadn't I hadn't um listened to your podcast or I looked to see who you'd had on so. Uh, yeah, so I didn't know uh, what what you'd be asking about. So I have to read that book now, won't I? <laughs> yeah, he's no, he's very, he's very complimentary about it. Yeah, it's like, and it's about a very me. candid book about you. Yeah. Oh well, that's nice. Well, it's good to it's good to know because you know, um, yeah, it's great times, and it's uh, I'm glad he, I'm glad, you know, I think in what he do, he does not. I like happy endings personally, so you know. Uh, you know, you, it's, life's can be like uh, mod, you know, modulate. But I, I'm into the idea of happy, having a happy ending. So it's good, like, you know, um, you know, it's, it's it's good. So it's you know, yeah, we're, 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 all, we're all been through what we've been through. No, How are you similar. doing anyway? <laughs> Love that, mate. <laughs> it's similar. Uh, it's similar talking to Pat. Like it's interesting. Like these people, you know, just like he's come through all as well. Kind of the. The addictions and stuff and he's kind of like just making sense of it now but yeah similar to you he's just enjoying the simple things basically yeah yeah but i still see out of you know i have spoke to adam but i, I do out of all those people i speak to pat probably the most I keep uh, okay touch, right keep, keep in touch with patrick you know um yeah pat's a good guy and it's good to see he's doing all right man you know it's good to see he's doing well so uh yeah i've got a lot of love for patrick and um, yeah, as I say, yeah, I don't, I don't say, uh, you know, I've, never, I've not spoken to Drew, um, never seen Gemma, you know, I don't speak to. I did bump into Mick one time, Mick Whitnell. Uh, yeah, I just haven't seen. I did bump into Pete a couple of times back when Pato used to live in um, um, Southgate Road. Pato has not lived there for a long time, many, many years. So I've seen Pete for probably eight, ten years, but. Um, yeah, I do keep in touch with Patrick. He's a good guy, man. No, yeah, definitely. He's been he's helped us out a few times, so it's been great. Um and yeah, just got a memory of that Manchester gig for some reason. Don't know why that's just come to me. But just do you have any memories of the one is it up the shambles, is it? That was filmed. It's like the proper, properly filmed gig. It was great. And it's kind of a bit of an insight into I think Pete just rolls off the bus and goes on stage. I think you're in it as well. But oh really? Man, I'll send you a link to it? it. It's on YouTube, I think. Oh, so watch it. Yeah, because I because there was you know that's the thing. It went on for probably more time after I left. Do you know what I mean? And it was like I was at Andy and someone else was doing the management, and um, yes, yeah, so they did a they did a lot. They were bigger after I left than they were when I was there. Do you know what I mean? So um, definitely did more international stuff, you know, and what have you. So. Yeah, that's the whole side of it. I don't, you know, I don't know. So, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I, yeah, we did. I did a two or three tours uh, with them. It was, it was great. So, uh, but yeah, I don't, don't remember. But there's a lot I don't remember. People come <laughs> up to me and t tell me some of the maddest stuff, and um, I'm like, you sure you got the right person? <laughs> but you know, it's good though. I, I, in some ways, I'm glad I wasn't, because I, I, I would have argued a couple of years ago that um, I definitely remember every moment of my life uh, but that's clearly not the case and um in some ways that's a relief <laughs> i don't know why it's a relief but it definitely feels like a relief to uh to to to, to have holes in things but yeah um we'll finish on to your questions and just like was there a high point of that whole early 2000s and is there anything you do differently uh -huh. Is there a high point? Um, 
high points for me yeah there's there's two moments that stand out as high points i think both associated with baby shambles so yeah no we did a show early on at the um at the great eastern hotel i mean this is a little bit self-indulgent but um it is the truth and i was and and it was reported on a baby shambles gig at the great eastern hotel and i was talking to people there and i and I turned around and there was an orderly queue of people waiting to talk to me. And I just marveled at it. And I thought, you know, Jesus Christ, I'm the man. No, for someone, no, but, you know, I know that's slightly problematic. You know, you might, you know, it's a kind of thing to say, but um, it's the truth. And, you know, uh, I get, yeah, I guess it felt really good. And, the, and, the, and another one would be the, the shows at the Scala. Uh, when after the first proper Baby Shambles tour, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, we came back, as I said earlier, we left absolute laughing stocks, and then we came back, and you know they were. It was Baby Shambles was accepted by the NME, love them or hate them, uh, but they were a powerful sort of indie or pop music paper, whatever you want to call it, at the time. And we, I think the Scala. I think the Scala's got a capacity of about 700. And I think we had like, we had such a huge guest list. There was about 1,100 people in it on the Saturday night. Because that's right. I fell, after the tour, I was so exhausted. I fell asleep for the first night. Friday night, I didn't even turn up at the show. And then the Saturday night um, turned up and it was just, oh, it's amazing. And I like, had heard that it was all good. And it was just great to be back in London. Everybody wanted to be there, you know. And it was because, yeah, you know, it was it just the energy was so different. And it was just like, and then we, I remember we ran out of the, this is, this was so funny. This is quite funny. Like, right? this can I tell a little story, right? Oh, so I run out with Peter and we run out and we nip around the back of the skull and we end up back on Graham's Inn Road and we're running down the road and it, it's just, we're so joyous, right? And we run in a hotel, randomly in a hotel to get a room to hang out. And the woman in there goes, Oh, hi, Mr. Doherty. Your room is room whatever. And I think, oh, Rough Trade must have reserved it. Didn't think at the time, how could they know, right? Anyway, so we go up and we're in this room and a few people come up and it's all debauched and all that. And like about 11 o'clock, no, I don't, was it the next morning? No, it must have been that night, but we'd done a show, but quite late. A guy opens the door and walks in and it's like, why are you in my room? And we're like, what are you talking about? And there was a traveling salesman called Peter Doherty booked into the hotel. And the woman on the desk just saw this Peter Doherty walk in and presumed it was him and let us into this guy's <laughs> room. And then, of course, how could a rough trade know? Because we just walked in a random hotel room. But it was, yeah, it was so, it was such a great night. And uh, it was absolutely magical. And um, yeah, it was great. It was, it was, yeah, you know, you can't, you can't, but you can't buy something like that. It was an amazing experience. And, um, yeah, yeah, not every day can be like that, right? But, yeah, but there's many, but I guess they, they would they would be the two, yeah, one, one was, a, yeah, one was in celebration of something abstract. Well, they both have, I don't know, but, yeah, it was, that was, I guess that would have to be the real high, I guess, the real high, that, that Scarlet Night it was good. And is there anything you would do differently or not really? Well, I know I should answer one hundred percent. There should there's loads. No, I would, I would, I would, I would. Do you know what I would do different differently? I wouldn't have become a drug addict, and I would have uh, done, done the job I was employed to do. Uh, I may have applied the similar philosophies. But I would have done it different in that sense, and 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 done a better job uh, 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 overall. Yeah. So, um, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot. You know. You know. I, I found myself in conflict because of the nature of the way I was approaching. You know, I got in conflict with 
uh, you know, various sort of figures in the music industry because it was all about the band for me. And I find that, you know, the behavior was just exploitative. And like, if you're trying to break norms of behavior, people are a little bit surprised when you say, what's this bill about? Well, you know, you know, for example, I'm not, I don't, you know, there was one industry professional who charges 330 pounds an hour for their service. And I got them to look over a contract and it was a standard contract and there was no modifications. It wasn't very long. So I knew it didn't take them more than a couple of hours to look at it. And um, they sent a seven and a half thousand pound bill back. And I and it was a hundred and twenty thousand pound contract for something. And I phoned them up and I said, what's this seven and a half grand bill? Um, there's no way this took you 15 hours. No, what would it be to turn us through? No, like 20 something hours to do it. It took you a couple of hours and I want you to bill for it. And they just went to me, I'm not charging you 600, 700 quid for a 120 grand con contract. So like it, they just chopped off an amount that they thought they should take out of 120 grand, which in any other profession, you get struck off. Like if you were a lawyer, a business lawyer, and you miss you miscounted uh, your hours, you can be struck off for that. But that was industry practice. And the guy was absolutely shocked um, that I would even question that. And that behavior is throughout. And I would not allow that to go. I would not allow that to fly because, you know what I mean? And so, you know, it's so I would get, I would have conflict, you know, the point I guess what I was illustrating was that I would get, find myself in conflict. And as people push back and I, I found myself, my only way of dealing with that at the time was I would, I would push back harder, you know, the going head to head with life is not necessarily the way to, uh, for a successful life. Do you know what I mean? And um, so, yeah. And then, so as I pushed back harder, I had more conflict and I was in a world of conflict and, I ended up just fighting everything and every shadow and I caught, you know, and I was bringing negative energy to the scene. And then obviously when you, you, there's a tipping point where mine, the, 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 the voices of James isn't the right guy. And I'm not saying I was the right guy, but it broke the bond with Pete to some degree. And, um, and, you know, that was of my making. So I, I would, I would, in that sense, I would do a lot of stuff very differently while still, probably allowing it to be underpinned by a still loyal philosophy of supporting the band. <laughs> you know, that's not another long answer. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good <laughs> finishing point, to be fair, yeah. Right, okay. Well, that, yeah, that's what I would have done differently. <laughs>